Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. As the speakers who've gone before me said, thank you uh, so much for coming. It's really an honor to be here, having been selected by you uh, to be the, the folks who get to speak to you tonight. Uh, and similarly as to my predecessors, uh, I'm, I am in the Navy. I'm not wearing my uniform tonight. They gave you the full disclaimer. It applies to me, too. <laughs> so uh, having strategically placed myself at the end, I'm going to bookend by returning to some of the themes that BJ started us off with tonight and talk a little bit about uh, leadership and strategic thinking and innovation. As Scott said, the piece that got me here tonight uh, was uh, leading away a review of uh, Admiral Robert Ray's book, Saltwater Leadership. And Admiral Ray uh, wrote his book for the junior sea service leader. He said, here's a primer, so when you're on your ship, you can flip through this real quickly, read a couple of bits when you're off watch and learn something about leadership. And the way he decided to do that is he didn't really add anything new to leadership per se. He said he looked at about 20 leadership books and summarized some lists from them, and he surveyed dozens of naval leaders, uh, Coast Guard leaders, officers, and senior enlisted, and said, what are your stories, what are your tips, um, as well as that list of traits that BJ referred to earlier. And when I read the book, what struck me about this methodology is it really provided a cultural snapshot of what leaders in the Navy think junior leaders need to do. And what struck me about that is Admiral Ray summarized all this by saying that junior leaders should be honest, hardworking teammates. And that's really good advice. They do need to do that. Um, that's advice that's going to help them get things done. But it's not advice that's going to help them figure out what things need to get done, particularly as they rise through the ranks. Um, and so that's where I want to tie to this question of strategic thinking and innovation, and particularly the third offset's been discussed earlier tonight, which is supposed to have this big innovation section to it. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie Run Silent, Run Deep? 1958, great World War II classic starring Clark Gable and Burt Lancaster tells the story of a World War II submarine and, and Clark Gable is uh, Commander Richardson and at the beginning of the war, his submarine gets sunk out from under him. Somehow he survives. He makes it back to Pearl Harbor uh, by this Japanese destroyer. And uh, he is ready for revenge, and he goes to Packley and says, give me another submarine. And uh, they convince him, and he gets the USS Nurka, which uh, uh, Burt Lancaster, Lieutenant Bledsoe, thinks was going to be his ship. So instead, he's the XO. Some conflict there. And Commander Richardson takes this ship out for, for drill, and he does these drills so his crew doesn't understand. He's up in the conning tower, and he says, you're going to go straight. I want you to pretend that there's a ship right off our bow. I'm going to give you the order. I'm going to scurry down the ladder. We're going to submerge as fast as we can and fire a torpedo. And he times them. He wants it done in like two minutes, some ridiculous time. And they can't do it. And they drill and they drill and they drill and they drill. And the crew doesn't understand. And this is stupid and it's a waste of their time. And finally he gets up, but he keeps making them do it. Finally they get on, you know, they get onto the time and they go out on war patrol. And they're on patrol. And Ken Richardson keeps avoiding opportunities to sink Japanese shipping, which is his mission. And uh, Lieutenant Bledsoe gets really fed up. The crew gets really fed up. More, more conflict. Finally, they find out Richardson's taking them back to where his first submarine was sunk. And uh, at the climax of the film, uh, he is head on with the Japanese destroyer. And it becomes clear what he's trying to do. Because he gives the order. He goes below. He fires a very active torpedo shot at the bow of the destroyer, which was to be impossible shot, and submerges the submarine to dive beneath it as the torpedo impacts. Now, there's a surprise that happens that I'm not going to spoil. <laughs> but what strikes me about this movie is what Richardson was able to do, right? The commanding officer of a U.S. Navy warship, there was a tactical problem that he thought needed to be solved. He took his crew out, and he trained them to do it, and he solved that problem. And I wonder, could we do that in the U.S. Navy today? I certainly believe that there are the officers out there who have the thinking capability to do that. Would they have the resources and the freedom and the time to do that? And I, quite frankly, am uncertain. But to think about that a little more, there are kind of two things I want to touch on. One is sort of structural, foundational to our Navy, and a paradox about why we are simultaneously, I think, the service best equipped to innovate, but also perhaps less likely to do so. Uh, and then maybe a thought about what we can do to increase our likelihood. So the paradox first. I think all, all organizations have some sort of structural feature uh, which defines much of their culture. And for any Navy, it's the fact that we go to sea on ships. Right? And what does that mean for a commanding officer? You've got one guy who's got to control the 
200 to 5,000 people who he's got on his ship. If they decide they don't like him, he can't run away. Now, 500 years ago, we solved this problem by whipping people, sometimes giving them some rum, and we had Marines on board to shoot them if they really wouldn't comply. Right? Now, today, we have a little bit more enlightened approach, but that problem from our culture still remains. And as a result, we take a very conservative approach to new ideas, particularly new ideas which would threaten the authority uh, and the expertise of that commanding officer. For those of you who have been to see, how many times have you heard a comment about the good idea fairy, right? And the good idea fairy is never all that good, right? The paradox of this is the very independence provided by going to sea means that Navy commanding officers have more opportunity to do what Commander Richardson did than probably commanding officers in any other service. If you're a battalion commander in the Army, you always have to be able to integrate with your higher headquarters and cooperate with the units that are on your flanks. Maybe if you're a company commander who's operating off on his own on some special mission, you have a little bit more freedom. Right? But you always have to be a little bit more standardized. So the very structure of the Navy both gives us a culture that makes it harder to innovate, but a structure that makes us more likely to be able to do so. And so what I want to close on is say, so how can we change this? Cultural change is obviously hard. I'm not going to pretend that I can solve that problem for you. But I want to offer a slightly more unorthodox idea, maybe, than some of the things that we have talked about frequently are being talked about now, where there's structures to focus up specifically on innovation and giving ideas the chance to percolate up, um, uh, or ways to change the way we manage talent, things like that. Um, I'm a big fan of trying to recreate the environment, the situation, to make it more likely that the thing you're trying to achieve is going to occur on its own than necessarily going out and brute forcing. Uh, I have written about uh, the Navy's uh, readiness inspection system and how that because we focus too much on process, not enough on outcomes on performance, that this really hampers um, our ability to be ready to fight. Uh, what I would suggest, too, is that it hampers our ability to innovate. Because the way we've executed these process controls is so detailed from the type commander two-star level, right, so detailed, that not only do you not have any flexibility as a commanding officer trying to figure out new ways to accomplish problems or solve problems we've had before, but that the accounting details are so much that you are focused on checking all those boxes and making sure your paperwork is straight and don't even have the time to take to think about those sorts of problems. And so I think that if we step back and we look at the types of requirements we place on our commanding officers, not because Micro, you know, yes, because micromanagement is bad, and yes, because there are things that are distractions, but also because it will give them the opportunity to think about these problems in a different way, to be Commander Richardson, though maybe not with a vengeful uh, motive, right? That we will del develop the tactics and the ideas that will make us far more likely to succeed uh, against any enemy or any adversary, uh, whether it be the Soviets with that World War II, you know, or the Chinese, or the Iranians, or anyone else. Um, and I think that if we don't do that, um, we are likely to, uh, to face a much bleaker future. Um, and on that somewhat unhappy note, um, I am open to your questions. Over there. Hey, Eric. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. That was awesome. Uh, and your article is really good, too. Uh, I always enjoy what you write. Uh, you talked about uh, increased administrivia, uh, which I think is good, especially in light of the uh, effort to reduce administrative distractions, which is in and of itself an administrative distraction. Uh, I think, you know, one of the hallmarks of the Naval Service, which certainly underlined that movie that you mentioned, was the concept of centralized command, decentralized control, and execution. And as we sort of endure the air forceification of our Navy and go towards more centralized, not just command, but control and execution, uh, I think we tend to we tend to lose that, and we tend to micromanage people. Uh, and we, we place a lot of the onus on our leaders, but we don't really, in this instance, but we don't really give them a lot of solutions, uh, things that they can do uh, to sort of combat that. So what, what are some things that you think that Navy leadership, the, the CNO, the SECNAV, can do to combat that trend towards more centralization, more administration uh, today or in the next 100 days? Yeah, that's a really good really good question and a really tough one, right? So this problem is, is 100 years old, 
right? Uh, when the first uh, naval ships got wireless radios on them uh, before the First World War and the first opening battles of the First World War, Winston Churchill is sitting like telegraphing orders to a Royal Navy squadron in the Mediterranean telling them what they need to do. And uh, the Admiral is essentially is deemed by the Royal Navy to lose the battle because the German ships he's chasing get away and blamed for it, even though he has these very contradictory orders from Churchill back in London. Um, so it's not a new problem, but the more communications technology we have, the more it gets worse. Um, one of the observations that I have made, uh, having spent a year and a half in the Pentagon now, is that the most successful senior leaders I see recognize that the more power they have, the less control they ought to exercise. The more senior you are, you got to focus on the big problems and not deal with the minutia. I mean, that's where we've gotten ourselves caught, um, as you say. Most of the problems I don't think start at the CNO SECNAV level, quite frankly, though. I think they're more in the, they're in the middle, uh, the type commanders, the fleet commanders, the places where they are. Um, one way we might be able to work with this, I think, is to do more exercises in a comms denied environment, which we can justify as uh, a real, like, war fighting scenario we're going to have to deal with, right? But that's also a situation that's going to train our, our commanding officers, right, to be able to fight without everybody looking over their shoulders, and then maybe teach some of them the value of that when they're older, right? Um, I don't think we're going to change everything overnight. I think the goal is to get one or two uh, flowers to sprout um, and hope that they can kind of continue to grow. Uh, so that's not the most satisfactory answer, but that's something we might be able to try. Um, I did like your article a lot. I thought it was, it was really good. It brought up a lot of good points. Um, Especially through the review of the the book, um, one one thing I'd say, and I, I guess it's a bit of a reining in, but it, it just a comment or anything else. One comment I heard before I took command was, um, it's the only job, well, first job in the Navy, you'll get to decide what you're going to get yelled at for, right? You really truly get that opportunity, and some guys will, you know, they they stick to that book and they're they're not going to get yelled at, and they do exactly what the type com, you know, type com wants them to do, and they have a, a good tour. And then other guys kind of go off the reservation and don't do what they're supposed to do. And they get yelled at for it, but they do work innovation. And so I, I think to a certain degree you're discounting that, that ability to decide what you're going to get yelled at for and, and how commanders, again, from my limited experience seeing it, commanders are given a bit of latitude. And very situation dependent, very fleet dependent and everything. But, but I think that is a factor that plays in. And, you know, kind of going back to the, the, um, the movie example, you know, his superiors were, wouldn't have been overly happy that he's passing up all these ships to sink. You know, like there, there's that side of it too. Yeah, he did develop this great tactic, and he went out and did what he wanted to do, but he wasn't really doing the mission that was assigned to him. Kind of, kind of thing. So just always keeping in mind that, you know, you get to decide what you're going to do, and hopefully it's in line with what your boss wants. You to do. No, I, so so you are 100% right, and I think that uh, when I talk about the, the the fact that commanding officers do have this authority, and if you Navy Navy's uniquely positioned to do that, that is a a perfect example. Um, perhaps in making my point, right, I omitted the fact that indeed we do have commanding officers that go and do those things. And I've had the privilege to uh, serve under some of them. I mean, it's definitely a different environment. Um, but I think that there is more we can do to shift, and I fear the trend is in the opposite direction. Right there. So I'm just going to share William Sims' story because I love them and they're fun. And my books will be for sale once we're done here. Thank you, Scott. So when William Sims was a, was a captain, he was the flotilla commodore out of Newport with the destroyer flotillas, basically developing the initial tactics for destroyer usage. And uh, they were off on exercises, and he happened to be in, uh, in Lynn Haven Bay, off of, down at Little Creek. He was down at Little Creek. And uh, some of his destroyer skippers were on their way back to Newport, and they were kind of passing the Chesapeake Bay. And one of them had an engine problem, and he was, he was down to one engine. He sent in a, a, a telegraph message, you know, so early wireless. He sent in a message and said, you know, Commodore, I'm, I'm on one engine. I've got X, Y, Z is my problem. I've identified these. It's, it's really hard. Um, should I come into Lynn Haven with you and stop in Norfolk, or should I continue on to Newport? And Sims sent back a message that was one word. Yes. And he got another message back that said, I don't think you understand. Here are my challenges. I have, again, 
one engine. Should I come join you or should I go to Newport? And Sim sent back another one word answer. No. And he didn't answer any more messages. And he let the skipper decide what he was going to do. Um, and I think as Eric is pointing out, until we uh, can figure out a way to culturally develop that where the, where the boss is willing to let the skipper make a decision, there are many who do today. You know, there are many, many who do today. There are also those who don't. Um, and so it, it's important to look for those guys and, and figure out how we're going to help support them. Okay. Now, Hunter, that's a great, great point. I would say hopefully there was some sort of doctrine, either official or unofficial, that came down that that Sims let let known, hey, you know, this is priority safety or priority is getting into port and that kind of thing. That I think that's kind of where Eric, maybe that conversation needs to go. It's less about the comm circuits being up. It's more about that implicit understanding of what you're supposed to do. I think the best times I had was when I had a job where I knew what the boss wanted. Not, not necessarily officially written down in the letter, but we'd had a conversation about it. I knew what was intended. And the worst times was when I went out there without any idea of what, what was desired. And, and it really wasn't, I mean, I could ask all the, all the uh, answer questions I wanted to on chat or whatever, and it was still going to be the same situation because I didn't implicitly understand what he wanted. Uh, so just two kind of two quick comments on that. I guess the, one thing I would add to sort of your earlier question, um, I don't this per perception of this trend I don't think is is obviously just not my opinion, but a little other evidence. Um, last year, the CNO Strategic Studies Group, um, the problem that it looked at, one of the parts of their solution that they said is we need to be able to operate more decentralized. And I read part of their some of their slides, right? And one of the things that they I kind of went I went to my boss. Post Commando Six, who had previously been on the SSG, and I said, "Sir, this doesn't make any sense. Like, this is like fundamental leadership stuff. Like, this is like naval command. Like, why are they saying that? We, like, isn't this obvious?" And he said, "Because clearly the 806s on the SSG don't think this is obvious anymore, and they're afraid that we're gonna like lose our ability to do it unless we make it um, unless we make it a priority." Um, and then, just real quick to your question about doctrine, I think doctrine matters a lot. I think part of it's knowing how your boss thinks, right? But part of it's also being able to think for yourself. I won't, I won't go into it in detail, right? But there's this part of the greatest controversy that stems from Jutland, right? Uh, right, is is about this decision uh, that that is made when the the Queen Elizabeth battleships have to turn to the north, right? And how long it takes them to turn. And the the Jellicoeites, and I'm partial to Jellico. As a person, right, but I think that the BDites are right in terms of command philosophy here, right? The Telecoites say he should have, BD never signaled him to turn, right? He was supposed to wait till he was turned. And the BDites say he was taking withering fire. It was clear the battle cruisers were already clear. It was stupid for him to wait to turn. He should have known better, right? Um, and this sort of initiative versus doctrine. Um, and I, I think we're going to be more successful if we have initiative and understand how the boss thinks than if we always wait. For the doctor, because the doctor doesn't matter, right? Um, but if there's a way to balance, that's the way I choose. Thank you, Eric. All right. Well, with that, we're going to be wrapping up again. I just want to give a great round of applause to our our presenters for tonight. To uh, Steptoe for again letting us use this facility uh, for us and I for letting us. Uh, have some uh, funds for, for some of the food and drinks for all of you for reading, for helping fund this event, for participating tonight, and just plain coming out for the event. I know there were some impediments with the snow, so hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoyed it, you know, feel free to uh, send your remarks and your feedback on uh, Twitter or email. If you didn't enjoy it, just email. Don't uh, publicize. <laughs> um, 